0430 hours, the summer sun rises over the English Channel, revealing a fleet of Allied ships heading for the French coast. The Allies have been quietly building up their strength for a while. And it's time to show what they can do. The Allies will land a large fighting force on a handful of French beaches. The first wave of 6,000 troops manages to land on the beach. Up above, you've got the Royal Air Force, who are managing to keep the Luftwaffe at bay. But what is meant to be a display of Allied strength becomes nothing more than a blood-stained slaughter on the beaches. It's a disaster. Almost 3,500 Canadian and 275 British soldiers fall or are captured. Losses total almost 60%. It ends up demonstrating that a cross-channel attack is a very, very dangerous thing, a bit like picking up a snake. You might pick it up and you're bigger and you're stronger, but it might turn around and bite you. Because this isn't June 1944. It's August 1942. And this is the Allied raid on the fortified French fishing village of Dieppe. It wasn't an invasion, it was a raid. It was a test to see how hard it would be to bring troops across the channel. And what was very clear was it was going to be very hard indeed. The absolute disaster of the Dieppe raid convinces Winston Churchill that landing in France would be absolutely suicidal. But casualties are mounting in the east, and Stalin's calls for a second front become more and more urgent. The Allies must return to Europe, whatever the cost. Autumn 1943, at the conference of Allied leaders in Tehran, Russia's Joseph Stalin complains that while his forces have the Nazis on the run in the east, Britain and America are dragging their feet in the west. His argument really is that war be won quicker if the war was fought on two fronts, uh, that they shared the burden in, in, in terms of manpower, in terms of blood expenditure. Because just four months earlier, Stalin had felt the full force of Hitler's obsession with the great Bolshevik bear. 1943's utter humiliation at Stalingrad and the 800,000 that have been lost does not dampen Hitler's pathological enthusiasm for actually wanting to totally destroy the Soviet Union and to defeat Stalin. Hitler's opportunity presented itself for the little-known southern Russian town of Kursk. The beginning of 1943 was such a, a success uh, for the Soviets that they'd moved so far in advance that they created a kind of bulge of troops uh, around Kursk, a salient, that was actually sufficiently exposed it could be exploited by the Germans. The Germans could simply cut it off. German Field Marshal Erich von Manstein smells Soviet blood in the 120-mile Russian bulge protruding into German-held territory. Von Manstein tells Hitler what he wants to do is to encircle the Soviets at Kursk in this salient and cut them off. Now, if he can do that, he will isolate 600,000 Soviet troops. Hitler wants to carry out Manstein's idea, but unusually for Hitler, he doesn't want to do it immediately. And the reason for that is the Soviet T-34 tank. If the Spitfire saved Britain, then the T-34 saved Russia. It has a V-12 engine, creating 500 horsepower. But the most important thing is it runs on diesel. And diesel freezes at a far lower temperature than petrol, which is what the Nazi forces were using. In fact, under the panzers, they had to light fires to stop them from freezing up at night. 
What made the T-34 stand out from any other tank before it is this stuff, sloped armour. What you get is additional protection, but no additional weight. The consequence was that in early tank battles, German tanks saw their shells literally bouncing off the hull of the Russian tanks. By the time of Kursk, the Soviets had over 4,500 T-34s in action, with thousands more rolling out of their factories. In response, the Germans reverse engineer the T-34 and produce a close but much larger replica called the Panther. It has a gun capable of breaching T-34 armor at close range. And despite having twice the armor of the T-34, it is faster across the ground. The Germans pay the greatest tribute of all to the T-34, having treated the Soviets with such condescension because they, they were seen as racially inferior. They were now copying their ideas. Um, so, you know, it was the ultimate irony. But the Panther is not the only T-34 killer Hitler will unleash at Kursk. The other was the Panzer VI, but that's more famously known as the Tiger Tank. Now, that has this really mighty 88mm gun that can take out a T-34 at the range of one mile. Hitler was waiting for his new tanks to arrive. These, Hitler believed, were weapons worth waiting for. These would turn the tide. After 1941's invasion of Kursk, the Germans executed 15,000 civilians and press-ganged 30,000 more into forced labor battalions. To avoid another Nazi scourge, terrified locals help General Georgi Zhukov's troops dig an incredible 3,000 miles of trenches, containing nearly 5,000 mines per mile, almost a million in total. This will blunt the German attack. Zhukov uses his idea of deep defense. So this sort of 50 mile zone of anti-tank trenches, anti-tank mines, anti-tank obstacles. It's extraordinary strength in depth, a bit like the Western Front in the First World War. On the 5th of July, 1943, Hitler launches Operation Citadel. There's a huge amount that rests on the Kursk battle. You know, one way or the other, it's going to be decisive. By the numbers, Russia has the upper hand. Over 400,000 more men, almost twice as many heavy guns, 900 more aircraft, and at least 700 more tanks. What happens over the next few days is a battle that is as decisive to world history as the Battle of Waterloo. This would be the last time the Germans would move forward in Russia. The German assault is an awesome demonstration of modern military power. But on the first day, even a battle group spearheaded by new Tiger tanks can only advance four miles. 200 Tigers and 270 Panthers are at Kursk. But Hitler's much-anticipated heavy tanks perform badly. They were seriously defective. They were over-engineered. They were prone to electrical failure. They were breaking down constantly. So they were a total failure. By day five, Germany's northern assault peters out and its southern spearhead is about to be severely tested. On July the 12th, on a field near the small town of Prokhorovka, Soviet tanks charge toward the German southern flank. What follows is one of the biggest tank battles in military history. 600 Russian tanks face 250 German panzers. What happens at Kursk is exactly what the Germans don't want. What they wanted was a uh, tank battle fought over great distances. But that's not the game the Russians were playing. The T-34s charge as close as they can to the German tanks, nullifying the 88's advantage. It's a close quarter, attritional battle. It's almost like dodgems or bumper cars. They're smashing into each other. 
became a case of who could turn the turret most quickly, who could get their gun onto the enemy more quickly at very short range. It's a real scrap, and it's turning into this utter carnage. The Battle of Kursk grinds on for nearly two months. The final tally is gruesome. Around 800,000 Red Army and 200,000 Germans are killed or wounded. 1,600 Soviet and 252 German tanks destroyed. Now, at first glance, these numbers actually may look bad for the Soviets. But don't be fooled by the first glance, because this was not uh, an equal fight. The Russians could replace those men. They could replace those tanks. German losses were completely irreplaceable. No single battle can dent Russia's ability to outmanufacture Germany. The Soviets produce over 14,000 T-34s every year of the war. Germany, by contrast, manages fewer than 6,000 Panthers in total. Unable to replenish their forces, the Germans retreat from the Kursk bubble. Before Kursk, there were still some rational German officers, not just the Nazis, who thought it might be possible to turn the tide in the east. After Kursk, I don't think for a moment uh, any sensible German officer thought the war in the east was winnable. What we're going to see is a retreat that's going to take place over two years, and it's going to end with one of those iconic T-34 tanks parked right outside the Reichstag in the heart of Berlin. Before the dust has even settled on Kursk, events unfolding in the Mediterranean will force Hitler to turn his attention and his heavy tanks south. Summer 1943. As the Soviets finally push the Germans back in the east, the Allies hope to put the Axis on the back foot in the south by invading Mussolini's Italy. Churchill sees it as the kind of soft underbelly from which he can approach from below, carve it, and attack Germany from there. In 94, you see, it seemed to be the only thing the Allied forces could do. But before they can invade Italy, the Allies need to secure the vital stepping stone at the toe of the Italian peninsula, Sicily. They launch the invasion of Sicily on July the 10th, 1943. Sicily falls in weeks, but in the midst of their first success in Europe, the Allies make a fundamental error. They leave the Straits of Messina open, allowing the rump of the Axis force to escape onto the mainland aboard civilian ferries. They had the German army right there in the palm of their hands, but they failed to finish them off. More than 50,000 troops, almost 10,000 vehicles, and nearly 12,000 tons of supplies could have been seized by the Allies. Instead, they are available to defend the mainland. Despite this disappointment, the Allies have scored a victory, and the taking of Sicily has massive repercussions. Benito Mussolini is taken out of power, and the Italians capitulate. Literally, a surrender of Italian forces as a belligerent force. That provides hope that maybe we won't have to fight for every last square inch of Italy. But Germany doesn't see it that way. They're quite pleased to be rid of their, their hapless ally, and they can now take control of the situation. The Germans race in, the Germans take over in Italy. To replace Mussolini's turncoats, Hitler urgently dispatches eight and a half divisions, around 125,000 of his own troops, to defend Italy from Allied invasion. They are led by Field Marshal Albert Smiling Kesselring. On the 9th of September, 1943, American forces land on the Italian mainland at Salerno, south of Naples. They find themselves up against some of the most hardened battle troops at Kesselring's disposal. That's the 16th 
Panzer Division. Now these guys are veterans of Stalingrad. These are the people who got out of Stalingrad. These are people who had experienced the toughest fighting of the war. They are seriously hard. Many of their American foe are virgin soldiers. A lot of these troops are, are no more experienced in battle than, than you or I, so they simply panic. US generals plan to advance far enough to eliminate German artillery by the end of the first day. But 24 hours later, their force is still pinned down by the beaches. So Kesselring has time to pour more troops into the area. Now, the counterattack very nearly throws the Americans back into the sea. It's only when Eisenhower becomes personally involved that thousands of paratroopers are landed close to the water's edge and the forces rally. The resulting carnage causes 15,000 Allied, but only 8,000 German casualties. What the Salerno landings really underline is how difficult it is to make a successful seaborne invasion. This was gruelling, terrible work for the Allies trying to move forward. Italy will take more time for the Allies to conquer than expected. One reason for this is the Apennine mountain range. 840 miles long and 80 miles wide, it stretches along the length of central and northern Italy. The Italian countryside is very, very beautiful, but it's a land full uh, of peaks, and that makes it incredibly difficult to attack, relatively easy to defend. A combination of intense winter weather and this rather impressive terrain slows the advance down. Taking advantage of this terrain is the Gustav Line, a system of sophisticated interlocking German defenses. Beyond the Gustav Line, you had basically a direct road to Rome. So it was enormously heavily defended. The Germans were not going to allow the Allies through. In January 1944, the Allied armies are knocking at the door of the Gustav Line, which the Germans nickname a string of pearls anchored by Monte Cassino. Crowned by its ancient Benedictine monastery, Monte Cassino is an impenetrable hill, standing 1,703 feet above sea level with a sheer 45-degree incline. Allied attempts to take it proved disastrous. The Americans and then the Poles and, and the British, everybody gets in on the fight and cannot overcome the objective. Some 50,000 men are gonna die on that mountain and it's all for nothing. The enemy possesses the dominating military terrain. So for the Germans, it's extraordinarily easy to put up a fight, even with a small force. So what can the Allies do? If they can't go through the mountain, if they can't go over the mountain, they can go around the mountain. So they tried something new. 20th of January, 1944, an Allied force of 374 naval vessels lands 50,000 troops at the beaches at Anzio a mere 34 miles south of Rome, which they hoped to take in days. Trouble was their experience at Salerno had taught them that they shouldn't move too quickly because the Germans would counterattack very strongly. So they waited until they had enough force to move forward in some strength. Staying put proves a grave misjudgment. The Allied decision to stall and to wait at Anzio proves to be an absolute boon for the Germans, who of course can then get men and material to the area. By the end of the first week, there are 71,500 German defenders in the Anzio area. Facing them are 68,000 Allied troops still clustered round the landing beaches. The result was stalemate. It was attrition. The invasion force is held within a beachhead and that invasion force is still there four months later. We were in almost uh, a First World War Western Front situation. On the 23rd of May, the 3rd US Infantry Division loses 955 men, the most of any US division throughout the entire war. Anzio is a bloodbath. This was some of the most brutal, some of the hardest fighting of the entire war. 
9,203 British and Commonwealth and 23,860 US troops are killed or wounded at Anzio. To relieve the remainder, the Allies have no choice but to capture Monte Cassino. It takes them 123 days, one massively destructive air bombardment, and four deadly assaults to finally send the Germans into retreat, leaving the way open for the capture of Rome. In June 1944, uh, Allied forces move into the city of Rome, and we can announce that the first Axis capital has been liberated. The first European capital is freed of Nazi tyranny. Now, in symbolic terms, uh, Rome is very important. It's, it's, the, it's the eternal city, but strategically, it's of no importance really at all. The government has already surrendered. The Germans are just able to uh, move back to another defensible point, and the fight goes on. Italy becomes a sideshow, because the day after Allied tanks roll into Rome, the largest amphibious force ever mustered leaves England's south coast. Destination, Normandy. May, 1944. In Italy, the Allied invasion is about to take Rome. But America has its eye on a far greater prize. At the beginning of the month of June, a third front would be opened in Europe with a cross-channel attack that would deposit two fighting armies in Upper Normandy. By necessity, the Allied invasion will launch from Britain, which means that American troops will be based there. By the end of the war, fully three million will arrive on her shores. The arrival of three million American soldiers on British soil had a huge impact on British society, as you can imagine. The British used to say the Americans oversexed, overpaid over here. The Americans used to say about the British, undersexed, underpaid, and under Eisenhower. American General Dwight D. Eisenhower is the supreme commander of Allied forces in Europe. He will lead Operation Overlord, D-Day. Eisenhower has only been a commander for two years now. But part of the reason that he was chosen was because he had demonstrated a diplomatic air. And it was a quality that the uh, Chief of Staff of the United States Army, George Marshall, recognized as probably being the most important quality. When it comes to planning D-Day, one Allied leader requires more diplomatic handling than the rest. Churchill, in particular, uh, had strong doubts throughout about the wisdom of, of this invasion. He's looked at the carnage at Dieppe, he's looked at the carnage at Salerno, and he just thinks that this landing on a massive scale is going to meet exactly the same fate. Commander-in-chief of Allied ground forces will be the hero of the British North Africa campaign, General Bernard Montgomery. In the planning stages, their first priority is a lack of vital equipment. The way that amphibious landing operations succeeded was by putting angry young men with rifles and bayonets on a beach. And the best way to do that was with a landing craft. But so many landing craft have been lost in the Pacific and Italian campaigns that there is a shortage. So the Allies order over 30,000 new ones. Many will be built in a place more famous for its Mardi Gras than for producing war material. The city of New Orleans, Louisiana, contributed significantly to Allied victory in the Second World War through the production of landing craft by a company called Higgins Industries. Higgins Industries has five industrial manufacturing facilities and he employs 30,000 people. Higgins was making more of them than anyone else. The timing of the invasion was being tuned to an additional month of output from Higgins Industries. That's how critical this need for landing craft became. In May 44, Eisenhower and Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery called an above top secret meeting at St. Paul's School, London. This is the unveiling of the invasion plan. This is where the people that matter are told. Named Operation Overlord, the invasion will take place on five Normandy beaches. There are going to be two beaches where the Americans attack, Omaha and Utah. There's going to be one beach where the Canadians attack, 
Juno, and then Gold and Sword are the two beaches where the British are going to attack. An invasion date is also set, the 5th of June. To maximize the chances of success, the Allies must keep these details completely secret. The capacity of the Germans to inflict damage on the Allies uh, was going to be very large indeed if they guessed where the invasion was going to happen and they had enough forces there. So to swing the numbers in their favor, the Allies turned to black ops. The Allies came up with an extraordinary deception operation. Named Operation Fortitude, it is split in two. Fortitude South tries to persuade the Germans that the main target of the invasion will be the Pas de Calais, where Hitler has 350,000 troops garrisoned. Of course, to the Germans, it seems totally logical that the Allies would attack at the Pas de Calais. It's just 21 miles across the channel from Kent. So, of course, it makes total sense for them to believe that. What the deceivers did was absolutely brilliant. They build up this kind of totally dummy army. Some of it's made out of nylon props from Shepparton Studios that makes any German reconnaissance aircraft think that there are an enormous amount of men and material positioned all over Kent, ready for an attack around Calais. There were camps full of tents with inflatable tanks, with inflatable trucks, with inflatable aircraft occupying airfields that were not actually functioning airfields. And in fact, it's so successful, the Germans actually tie up a huge number of divisions, thinking that 30 divisions are going to come across the channel from Dover to Calais. It's a complete charade. Fortitude North places another ghost army in Scotland. This one's job is to persuade Hitler that the main invasion might happen in Norway. Between them, the deception plans have the capacity to tie down more than 700,000 troops in Calais and Norway. It's an absolutely brilliant use of distracting tactics. Despite Fortitude's success, Allied forces will still face five million mines and a significant German defense, protected by a bespoke fortification that Hitler calls his Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall was a system of integrated German coastal defenses, stretching basically from Norway all the way down to the French border with Spain on the Bay of Biscay. Hitler ordered the building of the Atlantic Wall in spring 1942. Over two years, slave laborers used over a million tons of steel and 13 million cubic meters of concrete to build a three-tier fortification system stretching almost 2,000 miles. The construction of 15,000 separate concrete artillery and machine gun emplacements will be manned by 300,000 soldiers. They were armed with anti-tank, anti-boat guns, ranging in caliber from the German 50-millimeter gun to 75-millimeter guns to the 88-millimeter gun, particularly the 88-millimeter anti-tank gun. RAF reconnaissance planes have been busy above the Atlantic Wall. It's believed that over a million photo reconnaissance images of the beaches and the inland areas near the beaches were taken in anticipation of the D-Day landings. The photographs reveal that each of the designated Allied landing beaches is defended. Getting off them will be a living hell. The Germans had pre-ranged and pre-sighted almost everything so that if anything landed in front of any of those resistance nests, they could distribute either automatic weapons fire very effectively, or they could drop mortar fire on top of those targets. And in fact, what we see on D-Day is that, despite what the movies would have you believe, it's not really machine guns that are doing the most killing, it's mortars that are doing the most killing. In the two months before D-Day, the RAF and US Air Force engage in a concerted campaign against strategic targets. Come D-Day, the Germans only have 815 serviceable aircraft that can be used against the Allies. The Allies, meanwhile, have a ratio of 14 to 1 superiority over them. That's a huge mismatch. They are aided by the French resistance. A total
total of 74 bridges and tunnels are destroyed in the month leading up to D-Day. By early June, rail traffic is cut by two-thirds. And as a result, the German response to, to D-Day was much less effective than it ought to have been. Everything is ready, but the Allies are still not certain of success. General Eisenhower is so unsure that he writes a letter taking the blame for the failure of the assault and keeps it in his pocket in case it all goes wrong. Sixth of June, 1944. At 3.30, Eisenhower wakes up. Outside, it's wind, it's rain. This is far from ideal for an invasion. But the weatherman, John Stagg, says to him, it's going to clear, it's going to clear in about 30 minutes. Eisenhower then has to make the biggest decision of his life. OK, let's go, he says. Bad weather has already caused an abortive launch, but today, the first ships of the Allied Armada set sail for Normandy. They have a 100-mile journey and will arrive later that morning. Rommel, who is the man responsible for the Atlantic Wall defences, isn't ready to go. In fact, he's not even there. He's celebrating his wife's birthday in Germany. While the bulk of German defenders sleep, the Allies are preparing to clear a path off the beaches for their vast army of tanks and trucks. Six and a half hours before the land invasion starts, you have three gliders containing 181 British paratroopers landing less than 50 yards from Pegasus Bridge. Elements of the 6th Airborne Division, particularly the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, conduct a coup de main aerial assault using gliders, during which they capture the two bridges across the Combe Canal and the Orne River. They capture them intact in a very, very daring pre-dawn attack. It's an incredibly successful attack, but it's not without casualties. A Lieutenant Brotheridge is mortally wounded trying to get across the bridge. And in fact, he is the first man to die as a result of enemy fire on D-Day. The number of ships steaming toward France is by far the largest fleet ever put to sea. The Allied Armada is big. You've got almost 7,000 ships coming across in all different forms, such as cruisers, destroyers, battleships, landing vessels. And you've got another 277 minesweepers. That's a lot and they were all heading for these five beaches. 0545 hours, June the 6th, 1944. The gathered battleships of the D-Day Armada begin a massive bombardment of the Atlantic Wall's big guns. The first thing to do is that you've got to take out the big guns on the beaches. Meanwhile, troop landing craft and minesweepers start heading for the beaches. The Allied invasion has begun. More than 4,000 landing craft are about to deliver 156,000 troops to the Normandy beaches. To ensure as many of them as possible survive, supporting naval artillery fire must target shoreline anti-personnel defences. You have this ungoverned, fire at whatever you want to from 5.45 to 6.30, and then stop at 6.30, then you'll start getting radio calls where you're delivering fire on map coordinates with great precision so, that, so as not to endanger your own troops. The bombardments called in by naval shorefire control parties on Gold, Sword, Utah, and Juneau beaches are relatively successful. But for the Americans landing at Omaha Beach, it's a very different story. One of the main reasons was that troops stepped off of their landing craft into water that was this deep in some cases. And so if you have the SCR 300 radio that they called the, um, the walkie-talkie on your back, the radio is soaking wet. It's not going to function when you reach the beach. The lack of radio contact leaves supporting naval vessels unable to locate their targets. They can't fire a single shot because they might kill our own people. The biggest fighting position on Omaha Beach was the WN-62 bunker complex. That position was killing, actively killing men of the 1st Infantry Division from 
0630 until about 10 o'clock. The taking of Omaha Beach costs 2,000 American lives, compared to just 197 at neighboring Utah. Fighting is fierce along the entire coastline. But the Allied troops finally make it off their beaches. It's cost 9,000 casualties. But five days later, 326,000 men, 54,000 vehicles, and 104,000 tons of supplies have made it ashore. But that's only a fraction of the entire invasion force. To land the rest, the Allies need a port. The nearest is Sherbrooke. Three complete infantry divisions, each one numbering almost 15,000 men, are descending down from the heights into the outskirts of the city. And then they bring up the three battleships, USS Texas, USS Arkansas, USS Nevada, and they bombard the waterfront simultaneous to three divisions maneuvering into an urban battle. The Americans think they're gonna take it quite easily, but the whole assault takes about eight days during which time the Germans just decide to completely trash it. Cherbourg is basically obliterated. To allow the Americans time to build up a force large enough to break out and head south, Montgomery launches a head-on attack on the town of Caen. The Germans are so dug in that it's almost impossible to winkle them out. In the suburbs of Caen, you've got a real war of attrition starting to develop. It takes 1,800 heavy bombers carpet bombing the German line with 4,200 tons of bombs to blast away through in Operation Cobra. By July the 24th, losses are almost even. 122,000 Allied troops have been killed, wounded or captured, compared to 114,000 German. But while the Allies are being heavily reinforced from England, little more than 10,000 German replacements have been sent. The Allies are also winning the numbers game because Hitler is still under the spell of Operation Fortitude's Ghost Army. There are five armor divisions and 19 infantry divisions in the vicinity of the Pas de Calais. Uh, that's a force of 350,000 men who could have joined the Normandy battle, but did not. In typical fashion, Hitler orders his depleted forces to launch a counterattack, centered on the town of Mortain. It's a fatal error. Seventeenth of July, 1944. German commander Erwin Rommel fractures his skull when his car is strafed en route back to headquarters. So the Desert Fox is replaced by Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge, who will preside over the defining moment in the battle for Normandy. It happens when the Mortain offensive grinds to a halt near the town of Falaise. The Mortain counteroffensive was meant to relieve some of the pressure on the Germans, and instead what it does is it creates circumstances where the Germans overexpose. Montgomery sees an opportunity. The German advance into what becomes known as the Falaise Pocket creates the opportunity for the Allies to trap nigh on 200,000 German troops. The idea is that you get the British and Canadians to pin them down at Falaise, and then you get the US Third Army to encircle them and to stop them escaping. Patton breaks around, slides around their flanks, comes up from the south with General Leclerc and the French Second Armored Division, and that ever-closing pocket begins to tighten but suddenly, it's clear the Germans have got to get out. Otherwise, they were going to be caught. They're going to be encircled. The encirclement is not quite complete, so Field Marshal von Kluger orders a retreat through the gap. He is immediately relieved of command by an enraged Hitler. For the men left trapped inside the Falaise pocket, a change of leadership cannot stave off the inevitable bloodbath. 45,000 Germans are taken prisoner and about 10,000 lie dead. Eisenhower went and saw it for himself and he said it's one of the worst killing fields that he had ever seen. To 
Despite the numbers, Falaise feels like a missed opportunity. The pocket could have been closed uh, if, it, if the Allies had moved faster and, and more firmly. A lot stream out. About 40,000 German troops make it out of the pocket. They're literally running for their lives, and most of them don't even have any weapons. They're rushing for the river Seine, and many of them manage to cross it, but they're lashed together on cider barrels. Some are trying to swim. They're absolutely desperate to get to safety. The Germans do not have the numbers to cope with the overwhelming Allied advance. The battle for Normandy is over. And on the Eastern Front, Stalin's generals are about to deliver an even more devastating blow against the beleaguered Nazis. Twenty second of June, nineteen forty four. Three years to the day since Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa. Today, a long line stretching over nine hundred miles from Odessa in the south to Leningrad in the north, Stalin unleashes Operation Bagration. Operation Bagration is quite possibly the most successful offensive that you've never heard of. It's significant in its timing in, in two respects. It's time to coincide, broadly speaking, with uh, the D-Day landings. But it's symbolic in another sense, in that it's uh, time to coincide with the date upon which the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union uh, back in 1941. Finally, this is Stalin now going, I'm going to get my own back in an equally devastating manner. It was named Bagration after the prince who'd harried Napoleon's forces uh, from Moscow in 1812. Fifteen Soviet armies, numbering 1,670,000 soldiers, are secretly assembled. They are supported by more than 6,000 tanks and over 30,000 guns and Katyusha rocket batteries. They had so much artillery that the Red Army could stretch 400 artillery pieces per mile for a front 350 miles long. That's a lot of firepower. Because the Luftwaffe has been withdrawn to Normandy and the defense of Berlin, the Russians also enjoy total air superiority. So they deploy more than 7,500 aircraft at will, including their Sturmovik dive bomber. There were waves of Sturmoviks dive bombing the enemy, then the infantry were moving forward and simply encircling those who remained. They were essentially reinventing Blitzkrieg for their own purposes. Hitler was not a man who liked his soldiers to retreat, and so often they were just stuck, defenseless. And actually, their worst enemy wasn't Stalin, it was Hitler himself. Operation Bagration is so devastating that by the time it stops outside Warsaw on the 7th of August, 1944, the Red Army has advanced 450 miles, retaken the key cities of Vitebsk, Minsk and Vilnius, cut off Riga in the north and pushed into Poland to seize the towns of Lublin and Lwów. Bagration kills, wounds, or captures more than 450,000 Germans. It captures or destroys over 2,000 tanks, more than 10,000 guns, and 57,000 vehicles. It happens in the same month as the Falaise Gap assault by the Allies over in France, and it actually captures 10 times more troops than that. This almost knocks out completely Hitler's army group center. It's an absolutely devastating blow. By the end of 1944, Hitler had lost many more than a million men in, in, in Russia and France, and he had no way of replacing them. The Americans and the Soviets, on the other hand, had no problem replacing men. The numbers are completely against him, but Hitler stubbornly refuses to give up. Hitler's got one more kind of blitzkrieg-shaped ace up his sleeve. And if that doesn't work, he's going to take down the whole German people with him. While on the other side of the world, 
The Japanese high command will do everything in their power to convince the Americans that invading Japan is not worth the cost in manpower and pay the ultimate price when they get what they wish for.